the world, the whole universe, the the, the conceivable part of our existence came from chaos. Uh, she was the sister and wife of Zeus. She was the high lady, the respected one, the famous one, the glorious, whatever. Adonai, which is like the high god of the East, maybe, but he was uh, a death deity. He was linked to the underworld. But they themselves cast lots for the sovereignty, and to Zeus was allotted the dominion of the sky, to Poseidon the dominion of the sea, and to Pluto the dominion of Hades. So, here is a new version of the myth where they also cast lots. This, uh, this actually is, um, is taken from some Near Eastern religions, like the Hittite pantheon, where there is the successor of gods, and they understand something similar. Uh, I'm, I'm going to argue, why not? I mean, the final deity there was uh, a deity of, uh, of the sky and a deity of uh, meteorological phenomena like Zeus is, uh, after all. And he has some stages of succession through violent overthrow of the previous deity. We are Myth Vision. Ladies and gentlemen, I have someone who's going to take us deep into the Greek pantheon, the Greek world and their mythologies, and that is Demos Adonis Vrizis. I hope I'm saying this correctly, and uh, I'm going to just refer to him as Demos just so I don't mess up because uh, me with my American accent. Uh, welcome to Myth Vision, my friend. Well, thanks for having me. Um, actually, yeah, we're going to talk about the ancient Greek religion. Of course, we're going to talk about some connotations and some aspects that it gave to other uh, religious um, thought systems or whatever you call them, all right? Other religions, basically. Um, at the same time, we're going quite deep to the different pantheon. I'm going to argue uh, today about the possibility, the aspect of uh, or just the concept that there might be a succession element to, to the Greek uh, religion. And we have many different pantheon that evolved through time. And basically, as I told you before, Derek, uh, that could have been the fertile soil on which Apollonius of Tiana and Jesus and other actually other deities as well, particularly Eastern deities, would uh, try to create their own cult upon that infrastructure or whatever, all right? So real this quick, before, before we get mm -hmm. into this, just so our mm -hmm. audience knows a little bit about you, they've never met you, after this episode, you can go down into the description, you can support him if you like what you hear and you want to give him a one-time donation for his, his time and energy and efforts that he puts into this, uh, please, I hope to have him back as well in the future. So, Demos, tell us, do you have any education in this area that we're going to explore today? So, uh, I'm not a theologian, obviously. I'm a philosopher of sorts, all right? I'm also a tutor at this point in my life. Um, I was lucky, I was the lucky one because I finished first with my undergraduate studies. I, I achieved the highest grade at the University of Patras, where I studied philosophy under two uh, great supervisors that uh, helped me with my uh, thesis there. Then I uh, did um, another uh, course or program in the University of Bristol where I, where I studied philosophy and law. I had some components from philosophy and some components from the law department there. Um, and of course, I mean, some people in Greece might know me from some translations that I did of English poems and Actually, even uh, some poems written by the German philosopher uh, Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche. And um, I've written maybe two or three political articles or something, all right? Uh, but of course, we're not here to get political. Um, but, but there might be some comments, but of course, our, uh, let's say, uh, goal here is to to go deeper into some 
religious criticism and understand why religion matters or why it doesn't or what it does actually for our society. All right. So uh, before I start, I need to to give you these introductions and I'm going actually uh, deep. I'm starting quite deep uh, with uh, this one. Um, put, your, put your floaties on. With... We're going in the deep end now, so let's do it. <laughs> All right, sure, sure. I mean, I'm going to this uh, famous guy or whatever, uh, who is Karl Marx, and in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, he writes, for Germany, uh, you can change the country, I mean, for every country, actually, all right? The criticism of religion has been essentially completed. And the criticism of religion is the prerequisite of all criticism. That is terrifying. I mean, you need to criticize religion in order to make a better society, in order to live better with your friends or with your foes, all right? The foundation of religious criticism is man makes religion. Religion does not make man. But man is no abstract being squatting outside the world, like God, I'm adding. Man is the word of man, state, society. This state and this society produce religion, which is an inverted consciousness of the world, because they are an inverted world. Religion is the general theory of this world. Derek, mm -hmm. can you hear me? Yes. All right. <laughs> I think I lost you there. No, I can hear you. All right. It's encyclopedic. All right. Comp compendium, because my screen went black for some reason. It's logic in particular, in popular form. It's spiritual point d'honneur. It's enthusiasm. It's moral sanction. It's solemn complement. And it's universal basis of consolation and justification. It is the fantastic realization of the human essence since the human essence has not acquired any true reality. The struggle against religion is therefore indirectly the struggle against that world whose spiritual aroma is religion. Religious suffering is at one and the same time the expression of real suffering and the protest against the real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of a soulless of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of the people is the demand for their real happiness. So basically, here I wanna uh, um, focus on three points. First of all, as we've said, the basis of all criticism or the prerequisite of all criticism is criticism to religion. We need to do that. Then um, there is this notion which is actually quite older than uh, we think, that man makes religion and religion does not make man. And then, um, of course, it is this famous phrases, or phrase sorry, which uh, has, has been taken out of context quite a lot of times, which is the opium of the people. So religion is bad. But at the same time, um, strong drugs like that can also nullify the soul or um, liberate someone from pain, etc. So religion has also a comforting aspect, of course. The problem with scholars and critics of religion is basically that um, you can be happy or comfortable or enjoying yourself or believing that you will go to heaven or, uh, I don't know, be at the company of uh, fluffy little angels or whatever. But the problem there is that you can be happy with a lie and we don't want to tell you lies. So basically that's what drives people to criticize religion sometimes. Now I'm going to take you to another notion, basically. Um, you can show actually the second um, image or whatever. This one uh, about Locke, all right? Um, the idea basically there, I'm not gonna uh, quote him uh, directly, but the idea there is that uh, he speaks, basically um, the chapter is uh, about the state of war. So Locke is a very old philosopher. Um, he, 
he believes in the social contract, uh, this notion that many, um, let's say, Enlightenment era philosophers would use to, um, to, to formulate the need for political uh, societies and so on and so, and so forth. And basically, uh, what I want you to take from this one is he speaks about Jephthah and the Ammonites. And he says that, how can you judge between who's right between people? You need some place, some authority to refer to. And what Jephthah does is he refers to God the judge. And God shall, shall be the judge because he's the, the ultimate authority or whatever. But the problem that Locke here faces is another one. It's not a religious one by necessity. It's a worldly one. So religion actually is also uh, something like, um, let's say, a societal construct which uh, predates political, um, uh, I don't know, manifestations of human society, but at the same time, uh, it is like, like, let's say, like proto-politics. So the way that you that you have to, to evolve into a moral being and be kind to others and, and other things is actually the basis of the political system, is the basis of society. You cannot uh, um, have a society in which the God will say, thou shall kill and thou shall murder and thou shall destroy whatever, I don't know. All right. Uh, then I'm going again uh, to um, a more specific quote, which is basically uh, this second idea from Marx here. It's another German one. It's Nietzsche, another one of my great influences. Um, and he says um, in this little book, it's actually a very little, a very small book that he wrote, which is uh, trying to to sum up more, most of his um, ideas, and it's called The Twilight of the Idols, or uh, Gotzendammerung, which means in German, um, the twilight of the false gods, or something like that. And um, uh, there is a chapter there called Maxims and Arrows, um, in which he, he asks quite rhetorically, is man merely a mistake of gods, or God merely a mistake of man's? So it's basically the same notion there, all right? Uh, did we make a mistake when we evolved um, as hunter-gatherers, from hunter-gatherers to uh, social animals, and we substitute, substituted some of our weaknesses with a powerful being or sort of powerful? And then... Um, he has this quote on Christianity, which where he says that the only Christian that ever existed died on the cross, and uh, his life was uh, the opposite of uh, a gospel or a evangelion. All right, it's the opposite. It's a disangelium. He says a disangelium, which is basically uh, bad news, bad tidings. All right, and um, and uh, later on in his work, The Antichrist, he also uh, states the fact that faith under certain circumstances may work, may work for blessedness, but that this blessedness produced by an idée fixe, which is the, uh, the French term for like um, people having, I don't know, neurosis or something, by no means makes the idea itself true. And the fact that faith actually moves no mountains, um, however strong you might believe in this faith, eh? but instead raises them up where there were none before. And this is made sufficiently clear by a walk through a lunatic asylum. Not, of course, to a priest, for his instincts prompt him to lie that sickness is not sickness and lunatic asylums are not lunatic asylums. Christianity finds sickness necessary, just as the Greek spirit had need of a superabundance of health. The actual ulterior purpose of the whole system of salvation of the church is to make people ill. Now, I have a question here. Yeah, I have a question here. It's actually quite uh, polemic against the church there, all right? But I, I have a, a problem, let's say, here. Jesus was this healer. Of course, he was a man. Um, 
I don't know, a preacher, whatever you call him, maybe a worker as well in, in the Marxian sense, you know. I mean, he, he was coming from a poor background, poor upbringing and whatever. But um, he was, of course, a teacher of the law and all those things. But he was also a healer. And how can he say that Christianity finds sickness necessary and the Greek spirit needed a super abundance of health? Greeks had a god who was crippled. I mean, he had, uh, I'm going to refer to his Greek name is Hephaestus, and uh, the Lat Latinized form should be Hephaestus or Vulcan for the Romans, all right? And um, so here is my problem. I mean, I'm uh, going to show some of these aspects maybe later on. But uh, yeah, let's move a bit forward. Uh, besides the, that introductory um, ideas that I threw there, just for religion in general. So um, every religion is basically uh, has basically two components, all right? One of it is mythology, which is the belief or the doctrine of a religion, what people think of it. And then it has a practical component or element. Um, that is when you venerate a god, you worship, you show servitude towards the divinity, and or maybe you appease uh, a malignant god. Uh, whatever you do, I mean, it depends on on people's uh, aspects of religion. I mean, all right. Um, so, in the case of Greece, the age of mythological creation um, was around. Um, 900 BCE to let's say I would say 600 BCE but some people say 500 BCE basically it's from the geometric era to the archaic era and uh, in this notion then comes the classical, classical era and then there is some criticism of uh, the mainstream religi religious doctrines etc. But uh, I, I'm gonna um, give you later maybe during the final part of this presentation, I'm going to um, give you some criticism that um, some pre-Socratic philosophers did to religion. And it is quite obvious that from the archaic era, so from the time that mythology was created, it also had its critics. And those critics were sp uh, specifically vocal about some aspects, and they were specifically vocals against some people who created those myths. Um, the philosophical problem, let's say, we're saving, in, we are facing in general, is how beings came into existence, how it happened, and all of those things uh, sprouted. I don't know, appeared or whatever. So the ancient Greek religious. Um, let's say, hierophants or priests or whatever they were, they responded to these questions through myths. They gave us some uh, cosmological and theogonic myths. Um, one of those, uh, and one of the earliest actually, is uh, Hesiod's Theogony. Um, and now I have to, to ask, what is Theogony? What does it mean? I mean, the becoming of God or gods or the birth of gods is a good uh, analog or a good translation. Um, this poem uh, was written by Hesiod. Before I'm going to talk about Theogony in particular, let's talk about Hesiod. So who was Hesiod? Hesiod uh, describes himself in the Theogony, uh, that is lines 22 to 25, um, that the muses taught me, Hesiod, uh, how to sing nicely. While I was, uh, I don't know, I was a shepherd uh, with little lambs uh, under the, the, the godly mountain of Helicon. And they, those mooses were uh, sons of Olympus, which is the holy mountain, right? And, uh, and uh, they were also daught, uh, daughters of Olympus, all right? And uh, daughters of uh, Zeus, uh, the holder of the edges. The edges was actually a seal, a royal seal. So it's a similarity that 
the god is presented as being of higher status as it is with uh, the the Judaic pantheon, the Hebrew religion, and other actually Near Eastern religions, they always see God as something uh, of a supreme uh, social status, not only of a supreme divine status, but also of a supreme social status, all right? Um, then, uh, the Theogony is an epic poem of sorts, um, it was written around 700 BCE. It has over a thousand lines. Um, it is, among other things, a hymn, a hymn to the Muses. It is a brief introduction to cosmogonic Greek mythology. And uh, I went up and I um, did a rough uh, division of the text. I would say it has an introduction. It starts with a very nice... Uh, Quotation, we start singing about uh, the muses of Helicon who live in the great mountain of Helicon, which is full of gods. Uh, so mind you, Helicon is way to the south of Greece, around Boeotia. And um, they also gather around this spring, which um, uh, suits fast running water, uh, and they dance around the altar of uh, the all-powerful son of Cronus, which is Zeus, of course, this one. And uh, basically, yeah, it, it is basically a hymn to the muses, but um, it, it has an introduction of this hymnographical part. Then uh, it goes into uh, describing how the primordial de deities sprang. Then... Um, then he speaks about the Titanic pantheon uh, or the Titans, as we know them. Then uh, about the Olympian pantheon, he knows some aspects there, including the Titanomachy, uh, Hercules, some labors of Hercules, um, Dionysus, uh, the dying and rising deity. Um, and um, there is also a brief epilogue against praising the muses. Etc. Hesiod uh, wrote other uh, so, uh, other poems, such as the Works and Days, um, such as the Catalogue of Women, uh, and some other uh, purely uh, hymnographical pieces like uh, the Shield of Hercules or uh, a hymn to Demeter or Ceres would be the Roman equivalent. So, in this uh, notion uh, of um, in which we're talking about, all right? Uh, the world, the whole universe, the, the, the conceivable part of our existence came from chaos, all right? It came from something that sounds which- sounds very familiar. <laughs> all right, but uh, it, it, it sounds like um, when we say chaos these days, we mean something like destruction and, um, uh, something bad, actually. Okay, something not very pleasant. Okay. Yeah. But I, I, I'm gonna. I, I think I. I will argue here that what he means by chaos is basically unorganized matter, not in the sense that it has some negative connotation by itself. All right. The. the it's not organized. Thing... It's not organized. Is your point? It's not. Mm -hmm. Right. It's okay. chaotic, we say. No we... structure to it. It has no structure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, uh, the interesting thing, though, is he doesn't say chaos created the world. He says, firstly, chaos became or came into existence. By whom? He doesn't say. I mean, so here is an open field for other um religious uh, dogmata that entered later on into the Greek mythology, you say, oh no, you know, I know who created it and chaos was the offspring of this thing or whatever. Even in the, in the Gnostic texts, you know, um, those primordial proteinia or barbelo or whatever you call those crazy deities there. Uh, it, it's quite funny because uh, they could argue that, yeah, we know that person who did it, right? Don't, right. don't we? <laughs> right. Okay. But uh, Hesiod doesn't say. He says, um, 
that, that it came from uh, chaos and um, he he drafts on this um, uh, on this primordial pantheon uh, which is quite complex uh, uh, um, as you can see so uh, this is a natural let's say pantheon uh, you can argue that it has some elements of pantheism which is uh, the belief that everything is godly like animistic religions of the east and uh, like this notion that i found in some latin text the anima mundi the soul of the world let's say so everything has parts of godliness in it and um of course, uh, this pantheon could be linked with many fertility cults or um, matriarchal, let's say, mother goddesses that uh, one can find in the Aegean islands uh, of Greece or in Crete. And uh, of course, um, Hesiod tells us here that Gaia was graded greater than Uranus. So Gaia, which is Earth, was of greater status than Uranus, the god of the sky, is a bit like uh, John's gospel where the father is greater than I. Besides Gaia and, um, and Uranus, which is earth and sky, uh, there is this uh, deity, which also Plato knows of, that uh, is a very old deity, which is Eros, the god, let's say, of eroticism or erotic love or love simply love, right? So basically Eros or Cupid, as the Romans would say later on, was maybe that force that drove Gaia and Uranus, the heaven and the earth, the two, um, I don't know, natural forces to collide or whatever. And um, then uh, Gaia gave birth by herself, so as a virgin, she gave birth to mountains, seas, archipelagos, uh, Tartarus, which is basically the the bottomless pit in, down in Hades, like where the bad guys go or whatever, and uh, o Olympus, Mount Olympus, which is uh, the holy mountain of the Greeks. But um, most people, when they think of Olympus, they uh, have this notion that it is this mountain between the Greek regions of Thessaly and Macedonia, but at the same time, uh, I was uh, sometime I was visiting a friend uh, down in the island of Lesbos, and they have a mountain called Olympus there. And in Cyprus, uh, I think they also have a, a part of their big mountain that they have there, because Cyprus is an island; it doesn't have many mountains. But this mountain has the the highest part is called Olympus. So basically, Olympus means the mountain that connects to the sky. Basically, it's actually this uh, this idea that. Uh, this Garden of Eden, that that important place, but it is physical and not physical at the same time. Um, then Gaia uh, gave birth by Uranus to the Titans, to the Cyclops, uh, which have uh, very nice names, Ar Argus, Theropis, and Brontes, which is um, the fast one, uh, the lightning one, and... Uh, and the loud thundering one or something like that. <laughs> and then uh, we have those uh, strange beings, the Hecatonchire, as they're called, or the Hundred Hunters, uh, which were some sort of, I don't know, uh, mutants, let's say super mutants, like, <laughs> uh, I, I, I would say like giants or whatever they were, but they had like 50 hands like the Indian deities that have many sea or whatever. And then they also had uh, uh, many heads or and they were running all over the place. They were powerful and uh, especially in physical strength. Then um, chaos also gave rise to some other concepts that most people would see uh, as negative ones. I'm going in, into detail here because um, I think it's important because uh, uh, chaos gave gave be, uh, birth to Erevos and Nyx. Erevos is something like the eternal darkness and, and Nyx is night, a personification of night. Okay. And, um, and uh, actually uh, this uh, line of succession 
describes how the Greeks view uh, the existence of um, negative things in the world. Why bad things happen in the world? Because chaos gave birth to to Erebus and Nyx, which of course gave birth to Ether, which is the higher air, and Himera, which is day. But also it gave ber uh, birth to Moros, which is a deity of violent death, or Kira, which is also a, a, a violent death deity. Thanatos, which is, that's how we call death in modern Greek, Thanatos. It's basically all, all death. Momos, which is uh, mockery, and Oasis, which is size, and um, other, other deities like Nemesis, uh, the, um, the justice that you cannot escape, or uh, Apathy, which is deceitfulness, and Giras, uh, which is basically old age, and so on and so forth, all right? Some of them are not negative. So Hypnos is basically sleep, and uh, Onira are dreams, which can be good or bad. It depends. And uh, and then uh, we have also the Mire, which are um, the fates, Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos. Um, basically, Clotho is the spinner. Is this tale of the three old ladies uh, with one eye that they share? Okay, and uh, Clotho is basically the spinner, the one that spins our um, um, our threads or whatever we're made of. And then uh, Lachesis is the one decided by chance. Let's call her, yeah, decider by chance, because Lacho in Greek means uh, to decide by chance. And then Atropos is basically the unmannered one. The one who has no manners because she, she would cut our thread and we drop dead. <laughs> so that's how uh, ba bad things happened. And hey, Eris, so just, which just is... Just to know, I noticed yeah. that the Athanatos, I mean, mm -hmm. don't we have a, an evil character in, in Marvel, Thanos? Uh, you kind of wonder if these are modern ways of reusing these ancient evil uh, characters, if you will. So interesting. I, th I think so. I mean, um, it's easier to get inspired from mythology than to create a new mythology yourself, isn't it? And mm -hmm. that's what ancient authors would do as well. They would um, ascribe some new attributes to already existing deities. And they would say, oh, you know, I I've heard from a, a wise man there that uh, Plato does that, I mean, all the time, uh, that Zeus didn't have only these uh, children. He got more. He got Whatever, and then and then we have this notion that, that Zeus was uh, this uh, I don't know adulterous uh, old man or whatever, and he he didn't uh, listen to his wife Hera, and she was uh, zealous of, uh, jealous of him or whatever. But uh, at the same time, it just evolved that way. It didn't happen that way. Okay, then. Um, uh, Eris, which is Discordia in the in the Romans, and I'm um, I'm gonna give a few of the, of her children, and then I'm moving on to the next pantheon. Um, um, so she's a day of discord, all right? She gave birth to Ponos, which is pain, Lethe, which is forgetfulness, Limos, which is death by starvation. Okay, very specific there. <laughs> and then you uh, you have uh, battles, murders, um manslaughters and uh, uh, bad justice and whatever else. I mean, even uh, vows are, are the offspring of Eris. So if, if you give a vow, you're bound to break it. It's, it's inevitable. You are going to face some very, uh, I don't know, nemesis figures there. Um, and um, I don't know if I support this, but it came to me this notion which maybe be a bit older, let's say, in scholarship, but I think it's quite, it, it seems to be persuasive enough, let's say, that um, those panthea, so I'm going to talk about the titans in, in a few seconds, those panthea were actually just evolution of beliefs of people. So there might have been a time when the Greeks believed in those primordial forces because they had mother goddesses all over the place and they were like uh, they were giving them the title potnia which is like the most high lady the this superficial being the respected one whatever um 
and later on uh, this uh, this um, uh, idea was at attributed to Hera who was the queen of the gods being married to Zeus but um, it seems like there could have been a time where people believed this um, primitive uh, religious system and then they moved on they didn't like it they just skipped the page ahead I mean why wouldn't they right <laughs> and they described that one with a myth uh, they said uh, Uranus was a tyrant basically was a terrible being he threw his children down to the underworld and uh, and then um, his spouse Gaia was in despair because all of her children were thrown down and none of them would grow and become the, the god he would be, not the man he would be, the god he would be. And Cronus, along with uh, some of his fellow titans, caught Uranus. So there is this idea that Krios, Koios, Iapetus and Hyperion grab Uranus by the four corners of the horizon or whatever. And... Uh, uh, Cronus comes forward bearing a sickle in his hand uh, made of um, of uh, uh, adamant which is maybe diamond diamond sickle and he uh, and and it also uh, Hesiod describes it as having teeth of a shark of, of sorts it was like this thing and he um, cuts off his father's genitalia basically he castrates him in order to stop him from being the king. So that was, you're no longer a man or whatever, you're no longer allowed to be king. This notion uh, is common among many um, civilizations. For example, I was listening to some, I don't know, Harvard or Yale history course at some point, and, and it was um, this notion that um, People who were uh, about to have their hair cut off, they couldn't be kings in, in uh, the Frankish kingdoms of the Middle Ages because they were no lo longer manly. And people who had long hair were seen as very uh, virile and very uh, lord-like. And, uh, um, and, and there was this queen who said, uh, it's better to cut off the heads of my, of my grandchildren than to save their heads because then they're going to become man, uh, monks. They're not going to become kings. I don't want them to become monks. I want them to be kings, you know? So it's a ritual of sorts, okay? Maybe a macabre one, but that's what Cronus did. No, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I actually did a recent interview with Kip Davis. We were talking about this. I've also heard this same problem comes up in the ancient world with why they're against men. Uh, the idea of men having sex with men or, you know, this idea, it's a power issue. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not the issue of just, oh, you're not allowed to do that deed. They weren't even thinking mm -hmm. about the action of a man putting something in the hole that he's not supposed No, 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 no. It's men, their, their role is to be the top, is to be Powerful. a power struggle. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. so if another man is, controlling or overpowering another man they mm -hmm. look at that and they say no that's not good in the ancient world because they because of all this power struggle so so again it's like a practical let's say issue isn't it yeah it is a, a, a societal issue at right. core it's not a religious one they just ascribe religious um uh, prejudice to that then yep. um then let let me uh, go forward then the titans emerge as a new pantheon and who were the Titans? They were uh, seen in the classical era as mostly bad. They were the opponents of gods, but not, I, I, I'm, I'm going to argue here, not in a Manichaean or Christian or uh, Judean sense, I mean, Hebrew, Hebrew sense. Um, in Hebrew, Satan means enemy, opponent. But... Um, there were titans who were considered benefactory to humans. There were titans who were considered uh, worse than devils. They were considered, uh, I don't know, great opponents that should be cast aside and whatever else. Um, okay. So, um, the titans um, 
were basically uh, an interesting bunch. Um, they, uh, they, they were so Okeanos basically means ocean. He was a sea god. Koyos, Krios, uh, Hyperion, Iapetos, and um, oh, okay, and yeah, Koyos, Krios, Hyperion, and uh, Iapetos were actually those um, servants of Kronos that they would cut Uranus in order or the sky in order for him to to su uh, su uh, subjugate him, etc. And um, Oh, I didn't say basically. If, uh, let's go to the previous uh, thing for just for for a second. Okay, so basically, uh, there is this uh, Proteus figure uh, in the primordial pantheon. Oh, Nireus, sorry, Nireus, which is the old man of the sea, and uh, he could be uh, an influence of the sea sea peoples or those pirates that would devastate all of the uh, ancient Near East and. Uh, Eastern Mediterranean region, and uh, my uh, what I wanted to say about him is basically he didn't come out of nowhere. He is not born of chaos. He is not born of Gaia and Uranus. Basically, he even has uh, um, a, an illegal affair with Gaia at some point, and he gives birth to Pontos, which is the sea or something like that, and and other like sea deities. Some of them he gave birth just by himself. And then um, uh, in this myth, there is also uh, in, in the myth of the castration of uh, the sky by Cronus, uh, is also this idea that when uh, the genitals of, of uh, Uranus or the sky fell in the sea, uh, from that place sprang Aphrodite, which is Venus in the Roman pantheon, which is basically the, the goddess of love and especially sexual love, not love in the sense of um, love one another or something. It was more material, let's say. Then, um, all right. Then uh, we have um, many uh, titanesses or titanides or whatever you call them, which is female titans, like Thea, the holy one, uh, Rhea, the mother of flax, uh, Themis, which was um, an ancient deity of justice, and, um, and other deities like Mnemosyne and Phoebe. And uh, the Titans uh, ruled with an iron fist. They became what they despised. They became just like their father, more or less. Um, most of them, at least, at least those who supported Cronus. And um, Cronus was informed, I, I think, in Hesiod by an oracle, but uh, at some other texts by by Gaia herself. Um, that his offspring is go uh, are gonna slay him and are gonna de depose him um, the same way that he deposed his own father. So, uh, uh, yeah. oh, just just so I can um, get mm -hmm. this straight, because there's a lot going on here. Sure. Kuranos, the sky, mm -hmm. gets his mm -hmm. testicles cut off. They yeah, also sure. see creates love, more uh, erotic love. Yeah, exactly. Um, Aphrodite, which is the goddess of that. Mm -hmm. Then he had a son, though, named Kronos. And Kronos, mm -hmm. there's a prophecy True. about Kronos, who he also is like mm -hmm. his father. Yeah. And yeah. there's another story of the, is, is Kronos, you said he's mm -hmm. a titan. He is a titan. He's the king of the titans. So he was... okay. The major god in the Titanic pantheon, and he and, sleeps uh, with Gaia as well. He sleeps with his no, mother? no, he doesn't. He doesn't okay, sleep okay. with his mother. That's what Oedipus, which is a hero, much much later on would do. But um, this uh, this actually is um, is taken from some Near Eastern religions, like the Hittite pantheon, where there is the successor of gods, mm -hmm. and. They understand something similar. Uh, I'm, I'm going to argue. Why not? I mean, the final deity there was uh, a deity of uh, of the sky and a deity of uh, meteorological phenomena like Zeus is, uh, after all. And the, he has some stages of succession through violent overthrow of the previous deity. Yeah, and Kronos was uh, sometimes... Um, uh, there was this collision between him and Kronos, which is... Cronus was the father of time, and his name is so similar to time. Um, 
So his time, maybe he, he ran out of time, basically. His time has come to an end. And, uh, but before, before that, he, uh, instead of throwing his children to the underworld, he just ate them, okay? He just devoured every, every child that We're was talking born about Kronos now, not Kronos, mm -hmm. but Kronos. No, no, Kron Kronos, yeah, Kronos. Yeah, the Titan mm -hmm. is eating his children now. Yeah, sure, okay. sure. Um, is eating his own children, who are basically the gods, the Greek gods that we know today. And uh, Rhea, being a good mother and having gone through all this pain to give birth to them, was enraged again. I mean, those mothers can do great things, can they? And so what, what did she do? When she was pregnant with Zeus, she decided, oh, I'm taking a trip, I'm going some, some place. She went to the island of Crete. And especially there was a cave there, uh, the cave of Dicte, I think. Um, and um, there uh, she gave birth to, to Zeus. Then she emerged from, from the cave holding uh, a rock, basically, uh, in the, I don't know, the clothing of the baby or whatever you put around the baby when it's born, like the blankets or whatever. And she offered it to Cronus and uh, she said, there is your, your son Zeus, you can have him. And he devoured him like the others. He, he doesn't know for some reason, but he, he's not the, this omnipotent thing, okay? And <laughs> yeah, that's what he did. And, uh, and Zeus uh, stayed in the cave and he was nourished by either a woman or a goat who is called Amalthea. So in the later texts, it's a goat. In the older texts, it should be a woman called Amalthea, was his nurse or his maid or whatever. And um, in the older texts, like Hesiod, we have Zeus was born perfect, okay? But in the newer text, like uh, I'm gonna talk uh, later on about the library, the library of Pseudo Apollodorus, uh, he wasn't born perfect. It's like the infancy gospel of Thomas. Uh, every god is a child and he can do childish things. And Zeus was no exception. So uh, Zeus escaped and he grew to become uh, the god that he would be. He was all powerful. He was uh, all handsome. He, was, he had every, every blessing upon him. Uh, he was a son of Kronos after all. Okay. And, um, and Zeus tried uh, to avenge his brothers and sisters that Kronos had devoured. And this started. This led to the Titanomachy, which is a, a major, major theme in ancient Greek mythology. And they had many other um, uh, similar aspects, like the uh, Gigantomachy, which is the battle against the giants. Uh, the Titanomachy is the battle against the titans. And uh, uh, Aristophanes is actually the comedian, the great comedian of uh, the old times. He, he wrote... Uh, a similar uh, myth in which um, the frogs were battling against the mice and those evil mice should be cast down and whatever. And it was like mocking all those myths, you know. It was like, uh, yeah, of course, it, th those things happen, but uh, don't you know about the mice fighting the frogs? <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Okay. Yeah, that's funny. So what was the Titanomachy? As we said, it was, uh, it was some sort of battle or a a combat or a war. Was it like a mental or like a spiritual battle or a physical battle? So uh, I remember that you had uh, a, a podcast in which you, you talked or your guest and you, of course, uh, being a great contributor uh, about how gods in ancient time had physical properties as well. Not only uh, being perfect spirits, they were they had bodies, they had... All right, so I cannot imagine that Hesiod talks here about uh, Zeus throwing, um, or, or maybe not Zeus, some other henchman of Zeus, throwing, um, I don't know, like uh, spiritual rocks or something, or boulders to, to the Titans. No, he threw real rocks to them. And uh, the funny thing is, uh, we know where they were the capitals of the two kingdoms fighting. So the, the gods had Olympus or Olympus and uh, and the, the Titans had Othris, which is this other quite smaller, more uh, 
I don't know, unimportant mountain in central Greece, and they resided there. They, so maybe this is like a mythological way of saying, yes, there was this war, and those two uh, religions clashed, and then uh, after that, we remember the old religion, but of course, we have a new one now. We, we believe in different people. They, they were losers, you know? They, <laughs> whatever, okay. Then, um, the Titanomachy lasted for 10 years. Hesiod knows that. Apollodorus knows that as well. Uh, it is quite funny because some fundamenta fundamentalists would say, I saw Jesus yesterday. He was wearing the same clothes that he's described in John chapter. Okay. But of course, it lasted 10 years, says Hesiod, writing in uh, 700 years before the Common Era. And then Pseudo Apollodorus writing, a hundred years after the common era says it lasted 10 years. I mean, you just, uh, I don't know, you just repeat what it said. It doesn't make your argument better or something. You just got inspired by some, some somewhere. Um, then um, the Titans uh, got deposed, defeated in this war. Uh, Zeus devised this plan in which he nourished his allies um, uh, at this point, the Cyclops and uh, the hundred head, uh, Hunters, the Hecatonchires, were also uh, under the banners of the gods, and he nourished them with the same food that the gods would receive, which was ambrosia and nectar in, in Greece. But of course, we have all those like heavenly um, nourishments that you find in other cultures as well. Um, then uh, Zeus decided not to be like his father. He says that like emphatically, I'm not going to be that malignant being that pre-existed, but he is a great judge. So at the beginning, I spoke of how Jephthah and the Ammonites, uh, he speaks of God as being that great judge. And in England as well, there is this uh, notion that uh, there is this Lord Justice or whatever they call some supreme judges there. Basically, it's not a religious concept. And, and the Son of Man that is going to return and judge us all and cast us evildoers into, uh, uh, into the, the, the lake of fire or whatever, is actually a, a, a very social uh, aspect. It's not a religious aspect. It's just a judge sitting in front of, of an audience, judging uh, the, uh, who's right and who's wrong and deciding their fate. <laughs> it just it, it just uh, took some uh, uh, religious, let's say, clothing on it, like put a religious tunic, and then you became this. This becomes a holy notion, but it isn't. Um, uh, so um, I'm coming now to um, uh, to to describe a bit the gods, and then I'm gonna uh, talk about Apollodorus and some criticism. And then uh, that might sum up everything, basically. So um, the gods uh, were an interesting bunch. They were members of a dysfunctional family, let's say. <laughs> they were siblings. They were children of Zeus. They were cousins. There were all sorts of relationships between them. So who were they? They were not 12, as many things uh, believe, but Later on, they would be 12 on Olympus and the other ones didn't live in Olympus and things like that. But, okay, I'm going to describe the, the major ones. So, we have Hestia, which is basically Vesta in, in Roman, on the Roman pantheon. She was one of the, of the oldest deities. She was uh, a goddess of the altars, of family, of the hearth fire. She was um, quite a forgotten god because many Greeks didn't venerate her that much, but she, she was still a god. I mean, she was a goddess, I, I should say. She was still considered the, one of the, the, the big guns that we have. Then, uh, then we have uh, Demeter, which, um, which is basically Mother Earth at uh, uh, 2.0 or something. It's like the reintroduction of a, of a Mother Earth uh, deity because uh, uh, Demeter might be Gaia is the mother, or something like that. And uh, she is called by Hesiod the feeder of many. Um, and he also names her the Earth's mother. But how can she be the Earth's mother? Because the Earth was Gaia, <laughs> right? And Zeus, by the way, Zeus, 
uh, Hesiod tells us existed always. He always existed. How can that be? Cronus didn't even think of him before conceiving him in the belly of Rhea. So <laughs> where is he, this ever-living God? He, Hesiod contradicts himself in, in his text. His text. Um, then Hera was basically uh, the, the queen of the gods. Uh, Hesiod call, calls her the gold sandaled. She wears these shoes, these sandals that are made of gold. Uh, she was the sister and wife of Zeus. Um, she was the high lady, the respected one, the famous one, the glorious, whatever. Uh, what I find quite, quite interesting um, is um, how, um, how Hesiod calls Hades, he calls him Adonaeus, which is uh, possibly a link to Adonai, which is like the high god of the East, maybe, but he was uh, a death deity. He was uh, linked to the underworld. Then we have Poseidon, uh, the blue-haired one, or the cyan-haired one, as he said, he's called, the, uh, the saker of land or the owner of land. And he was basically the god of the sea, but he, uh, he was also causing those earthquakes and those... Uh, uh, he, he also made Odysseus suffer because Odysseus didn't like him much, right? <laughs> I mean, the Odyssey for 20 years, Odyssey, Odysseus is traveling in the Mediterranean and Poseidon is still angry at him. He, he didn't redeem himself enough. He's unworthy to be <laughs> back home or whatever. Um, so a few more gods. We have the twins, Apollo and Ar Artemis, uh, which are those very young deities. They are uh, uh, always young. They would... Of course, they would go on to have children, but they are also um, described as being very young. Uh, uh, Apollo is the far-shooting archer, the patron of arts, the patron of light, of uh, oracles, of prophecies. And Artemis is basically uh, a virago uh, or a virile maiden, which is like um, a, a, a fertile young lady that decides not to, to have children. And uh, instead, she would go on the wilds and go on the woods and hunt animals. And uh, she was basically a bucolic deity, let's say. Then we have Hermes, with, uh, with uh, whom, um, whom Hesiod calls the bringer of fame, because he was uh, basically an angelic type deity. He would be the messenger of the gods. He would uh, have these sandals. Uh, which would allow him to fly, uh, having wings, etc. And um, uh, there, there was this very interesting, I'm going to tell you this little myth, I think. There, there was this interesting myth. Uh, Apollo had a, a huge herd of cattle, and Hermes being his younger brother, he gave it to him. And uh, Hermes was bored with being just, I don't know, a herder. or Because uh, uh, Hermes is also... Um, He's depicted usually holding um, sheep or cattle because he was like a shepherd or a, the good shepherd or whatever. Or he was, but he was he wasn't that good in that particular myth I'm just referring to. And he was very bored. He he was like, I don't care about those cattle. I'm gonna sell half of them and I'm gonna make myself a fortune. Go to Las Vegas or whatever. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, okay, go to I don't know Athens, Corinth, whatever. Then. Um, and then he hid in a cave after he sold some of the cattle. He hid in a cave and he he got it um, he got it a cat and he got it um, a tortoise and he made the first liar and he started playing the liar. So uh, Apollo sees that half of his hair is missing. He's furious. He's I'm gonna kill this guy. He's he's not my brother anymore. Or whatever you know this drama and. Uh, he goes there to the cave and he uh, listens to Hermes playing uh, the lyre and he's gobsmacked uh, immediately. He's like, I want what he has. <laughs> I want it, it's mine. So Hermes, in order not to get punished by Zeus, who, was, who would be the final judge, okay, he said, okay, I'm giving up music. I'm just a trickster. I'm just a play, a play thing. I just uh, do those... Uh, 
So Hermes becomes a patron of commerce and also a pat patron of the thieves and night walkers and he's that strange deity. But Apollo uh, gets music out of this ordeal. And uh, there is this thing that attributes get uh, squashed over and one takes attributes of the other. Then um, we have Athena uh, as well, which is the, uh, the patron uh, goddess of Athens. Um, uh, she is also a virgin maiden. She is um, the spear bearer. She is coming out of Zeus's head in a myth. Uh, she was born like she had a virgin birth. She, she is the, uh, the bright eyed or the owl eyed because all were, owls were sacred to her. And then we have Aphrodite, the one we talked before, this um, titaness of sorts that became a, a goddess. And Aphrodite, who was the goddess of um, eroticism and love, is a very interesting one. Because she, she, had, uh, she was legally married to Hephaestus, who was this um, forge, the forge of the gods, who, who was crippled at his feet. He couldn't walk. His feet were, feet were uh, I don't know, handicapped, whatever. I mean, okay, he had uh, some disability. And, um, and but uh, he had wild escapades with uh, Aris, and Aris was uh, this god of war that uh, Homer tells us everyone hated, but Af Aphrodite apparently didn't. And uh, they uh, they gave birth as a couple to two uh, terrible uh, um, lesser deities, the Demos and Phobos, which is basically dread and fear. Which is, uh, which is described what happened to the hoplites fighting in a phalanx during battle. They were full of dread and fear. So those two go uh, gods came upon them and they overtook their minds. And, the, and that's why, that's how they describe this thing. So Because uh, Aris was a god of carnage. He was, he was not a god of war specifically, because Athena also was a god of war, but Athena was a, a, a goddess, sorry, a goddess, of strategic warfare, and uh, Aris was a goddess. Uh, uh, Aris was a god. Sorry, I'm messing their genders here. Damn it! So Aris was basically this god of um, of tactical warfare and carnage and blood and and this uh, heat of battle and whatever else. And um, he is called the conqueror of cities and the piercer of seals. Um, and then um, let me, uh, uh, so we have uh, basically two more gods, but I'm going to elaborate a bit on the on uh, Hephaestus before I, I go on. So Hephaestus, um, or Vulcan, as the Romans would call him, was this uh, god of uh, who was a crafting god, and he made many crafts, and he was associated with volcanoes and volcanic activity, because, I mean, it's hot down there, and that's what forges are, similar to volcanoes. And uh, there, there is this idea that um, one day Hera had enough of Zeus, and she gave, she, she had a virgin birth. Uh, she gave birth by herself to Hephaestus, and Zeus was, and, and the boy was uh, uh, was disabled at his feet; he couldn't walk. And Zeus comes back home, and um, and he's enraged. Why would you do that? And I mean, Zeus loved Hera, even if he had escapades and crazy and other crazy things. So he throws Hephaestus from uh, from the top of Mount Olympus or from the top of the heavens, basically. And Hephaestus goes down to Earth. Um, when we talk about um, uh, let's say, God and man hybrids, God-human hybrids, uh, Hephaestus does not come to mind to many people, but he, he was one, because he went to the island of uh, Limnos, he, he fell down there, and he became the most famous forge there. He, he, became, uh, he became rich, actually, by selling weapons that were uh, in perfect, of perfect condition and other drinking vessels and whatever else. I mean, he, he made all sorts of crafts. And he was very beneficial to his followers, specifically. And uh, 
There is this myth, I'm going to talk about uh, the last deity I'm going to refer in the main Greek pantheon, which is Dionysus, this dying and rising god, okay? And uh, in this myth, uh, after Hephaestus became the god that he was, Dionysus was the one who brought him back to Mount Olympus riding a donkey. So Dionysus saw the man, uh, saw the god Hephaestus being uh, crippled and disabled, that he couldn't walk, and he just found a solution. Have a donkey, uh, I'm going to carry you uh, to Olympus, I'm going to make uh, uh, talk to, to, to Zeus and to Herod of taking you back, and that's how he became a god again. And he was not uh, a castaway deity. <laughs> okay. And uh, Dionysus is, uh, is, of course, um, is of course one of the uh, of the most um, impo important deities. Uh, he was um, one of the uh, later, let's say, um, I don't know, arrivees or people who arrived at the party. He arrived late, possibly from the east. There are uh, there are millions of ideas where he came from. I would argue possibly the Asia Minor region, like. Uh, there, there was this myth than, that he was born near um, Mount Pangaeon and um, uh, around this place there was a king uh, who was called Lycurgus and uh, his uh, people accepted Dionysus and they, they loved him as a god, they venerated him, they understood his, his teachings and his blessings and his messages and they wanted him to, to be the new god there and uh, Lycurgus was like, no, that guy is not a god. I, I don't like him. Uh, so he said, uh, fetch him and I'm going to execute him. And uh, he, he couldn't cut him, though. He, uh, he could cut, though, many of his followers and uh, make them suffer, torture them or whatever. And uh, Dionysus said, you know, I'll be back. Something like that. He said... Uh, now it's time for you to receive your own blessing, my dear king. And what he did, he made the, the man go mad. Uh, the guy murdered his own uh, son because he thought um, he was a vine, basically. And uh, vines and uh, ivy, so vi the, the vine plant and the ivy plant were sacred to Dionysus. And uh, he, he thinks uh, he's cutting down these damn plants or whatever that have in, uh, encircled his palace and then he comes to, to his right mind and he sees he, he just killed his, his son and he's lying there and what did I do and things like that and then comes a prophecy that if you want your um, suffering to end uh, you should kill your you should kill your own king and that's what the people did and Dionysus was reinstated in this kingdom and then he conquered all the rest of Greece with his uh, worship. And finally, he, uh, he became um, reinstated, let's say, to, uh, to the importance that he was. Uh, now, um, I, will, I will move forward to the uh, library of Apollodorus. And then I'm going to give uh, the final remarks, which is, about some criticism of ancient Greek religion uh, during antiquity. So, um, I'm going to quote here. So, Sky, or Uranus, was the first who ruled over the whole world. And having wedded Earth, he begat first the hundred handed, as they are named, Briarius, Gi, Scotus, who are unsurpassed in size and might, each of them having a hundred hands and fifty heads. After these, Earth bore him the Cyclops, to wit, Argis Teropis Brontis, of whom each had one eye on his forehead. But then Sky bound and cast into Tartarus, a gloomy place. But them, them, Sky bound and cast into Tartarus, a gloomy place in Hades, as far distant from Earth as Earth is distant from the sky. So, at this version of the myth, we have no chaos. So, chaos is dropped. Though, 
it is it is th that important for Greek uh, cosmology for chaos to exist. But this uh, writer, the pseudo Apollodorus, writes uh, in in an era um, parallel to the first Christian writings, and he is writing basically. Uh, I call him the synoptic gospel of the pagans because he writes a synopsis uh, like a brief story of all of the Greek mythology and the many traditions and whatever. And uh, But he loses chaos because the political and social background in which he writes is the Roman Empire. It's a perfectly structured system. It's not the cha uh, chaotic g small Greek city-states that existed when uh, this guy Hesiod was writing this separate Hesiod was writing, all right? And, uh, all right, and then he, um, and again, he begot children by earth to wit the Titans uh, as they are named. Oce Ocean, Coius, Hyperion, Crius, Iapetus, uh, uh, and youngest of all Cronus. Also daughters, the Titanides, as they are called, Tethys, Rhea, Themis, Mnemosyne, Phoebe, Dione, Thea. But Earth grieved at the destruction of her children, who had been cast into Tartarus, persuaded the Titans to attack their fathers and gave their father and gave Cronus an adamantine sickle. And they, all but Ocean, attacked him, and Cronus cut off his father's genitals and threw them into the sea. And from the drops of the flowing blood were born furies to wit. Alecto, Tisiphone, and Megera, and having dethroned their father, they brought up they brought up their brethren, who had been hurled down to Tartarus and committed the sovereignty to Cronus. But he again bound and sat them up in Tartarus, so he became like his father, um, and wedded his sister Rhea. And since both earth and sky foretold that he would be dethroned by his own son, he used to swallow his off offspring at birth. His firstborn Hestia was uh, he swallowed, then Demeter and Hera, and after them Pluto and Poseidon. In rage that this Rhea re repaired to Crete, and she was be when she was big with Zeus, and brought him forth in the cave of Dicte, she gave him th to the Curites and to the nymphs Adrastia and Ida. So the Curites here are, um, I didn't talk about that much, but maybe uh, at a later time, uh, at a later. So um, there were these Orphic sort of deity whom Hesiod does not know. So basically they were uh, hitting their seals with their spear in order for Cronus not to hear the cries of uh, infant Zeus while he was staying down there. Okay, so... Um, um, daughters of Melissus to nurse. So these nymphs fed the child on the milk of Amalthea. So Amalthea here is a goat. And the Curides in arms guarded the babe in the cave, uh, classing their spears on their seals in order that Cronus might not hear the child's voice. But Rhea wrapped a stone in saddling clothes and gave it to Cronus to swallow as if it were the newborn child. But when Zeus was full grown, he took Metis, daughter of Ocean, to help him, and she gave Cronus a drug to swallow, which forced him to disgorge first the stone and then the children whom he had swallowed. And with their aid, Zeus waged the war against Cronus and the Titans. They fought for 10 years, and Earth prophesied victory to Zeus if he should have as allies those who had been hurled down to Tartarus. So he slew their galorless, their jailorless, jailorous campi and lose uh, their bonds. And the Cyclops then gave Zeus thunder and lightning and a thunderbolt. And on Pluto, they bestowed a helmet so, by the way, the helmet was made of a uh, dog's skin. It was a leather helmet, and it made him invisible, because death is invisible, okay? And on Poseidon, a trident. Armed with these weapons, the gods overcame the titans, sat them up in Tartarus, and appointed the hundred hunters their guards. But they themselves cast lots for the sovereignty, 
and to Zeus was allotted the dominion of the sky, to Poseidon the dominion of the sea, and to Pluto the dominion of Hades. So here is a new version of the myth where they also cast lots, and these lots give them their place in the universe. So Zeus becomes the high god, the god of the sky, Poseidon becomes the god of the, god of the sea, and Hades, whom uh, pseudo Apollodorus calls Pluto, uh, became the lord of Hades, the, the dominion of the und underworld. Um, so it, it was also common that uh, Poseidon was sometimes called uh, the Zeus of the sea, and uh, Hades was called the Zeus of the underworld, of the afterlife, or whatever. And uh, that's how uh, there is this, it's not a Trinitarian aspect, but it's this idea that there is, um, uh, there is three manifestations of God in various um, forms. And uh, I, I, I didn't talk about the, the Orphics, but I'm going to tell you just this little story about them, and then I'm going to the religious criticism to wrap everything up. Um, there was this Orphic myth. So the Orphics were a mystery religion, a religion for the initiates and things like that, um, in which when Zeus threw his final thunderbolt to the Titans and he made he turned them into asses, okay, um, Zeus was not a man who would waste his products or whatever he did, the mess that he made. So uh, he made, uh, he created the human beings. Uh, Zeus was called the father of men and gods. He created the human beings uh, partly by, by some matter and partly by the asses of the Titans. And the Orphics had this notion of the original sin, which was, you know what, we need uh, to clean ourselves. We are partly titanic. We are titans. Uh, we, are, we are having something bad within us. So it's, it's the same notion as the original sin. It's God is by nature bad, and we need to, to cleanse him of, of his dirt and make him a proper servant of the deity. Okay, so... Let us wrap things up, Derek. <laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> the first, um, the first criticism that um, came um, about those uh, beliefs in mythology and those crazy um, aspects of Greek religion uh, came from philosophers, actually, who were the first ones to say, um, stop it right there, it's, uh, something's, something's wrong here. So one of the, uh, the oldest uh, critics was Xenophanes. And uh, Xenophanes uh, has this great poem, which is called The Mocking Poem, or Sili in Greek. And he said, Homer and Hesiod have both ascribed everything to the gods, those things that are shameful and worthy of criticism, to steal, to commit adultery, and to deceive each other. As they said, many were the unjustifiable acts of the gods. They stole, to steal, to commit adultery, adultery and to deceive each other. But if mortal humans thought of creating gods, they would give them their own clothing and voice and body. But if bulls had hands, and the horses, and likewise the lions, could possibly scribe with hands and create art, artwork like men, horses would draw horses, bulls would draw bulls. Similarly, they would scribe the ideas or the images of gods, and their bodies they would make the same as, they, the, as the ones they themse themselves have, each one accordingly. The Ethiopians believe their gods to be curvy-nosed and dark-skinned, and the Thra Thracians white like owls and red-haired because they say they are related to them. Gods didn't sow from the beginning everything to mortal humans, but those humans who search for things for a long time, they shall find the best solutions or e explanations for things. There is, he also says, that's why um, Xenophanes was called the first uh, monothe monotheist, basically, because in his famous fragment 23, he says, there is one God amongst gods. Could it be Zeus? Could it be another one? We don't know. And humans, who is the greatest? 
who is neither similar in body to the mortals nor in the mind. He as a whole watches, he as a whole thinks, he as a whole listens to. But avoiding pain in his mind, he holds on to everything. He always stays the same without moving and he does not allow anyone to move from place to place. And also in his fragment 27, he has this strange notion that everything comes from the earth and everything dies on the earth. Okay. And basically this, this is quite an interesting notion. Some say that uh, the God in Xenophanes is a perfect circle because he watches with his entirety and he does all, he does whatever he wants. Basically he is an omnipotent deity there. Then, um, a few years after uh, Xenophanes was Heraclitus, whom I personally, I don't know, venerate as a god. <laughs> no, I don't, but okay. He was a very clever man. He said, um, by having a well-learned mind, uh, you, you have nothing to be taught by that. Uh, the, having a well-learned mind has nothing to teach a person. Otherwise, it should have taught Hesiod, he names him specifically, and Pythagoras, as well as Xenophanes and Hecateus. So he, he agrees that Hesiod knows many things, but they are not good. They are not useful. He also says that teacher to most humans was Hesiod. They know about him how many things he knew. That one who knew not about day and night. That they are the one and the same. So basically, I imagine Heraclitus staying up all night and he's like, oh, it's the same thing. <laughs> it just got dark, then it, it isn't. And, uh, and um, uh, of course, Hesiod speaks about day and night as primordial deities. He, he, they are personification of day and night, personifications of day and night. But uh, maybe Heraclitus understands him literally there. He says, yeah, you don't know that. They, are, they cannot be different deities. They are the same. They are physical manifestations of time. So he also has this uh, this one thing uh, in which he speaks about people participating in holy ceremonies. He says they clean themselves through another practice by becoming dirty with sacrificial blood. Similar to if one being dirty by clay would enter a clay pit to clean it off. It would seem manic if someone of these humans would speak in support of someone acting that way. And they wish upon these statues similar to someone who would pray to house walls without knowing what gods and what heroes really are. So basically, okay, you can pray to your stage, you can play, pray to your icon, but okay, all right. Pray to a house is better. Maybe you will receive better things. The house is going to protect you from, uh, I don't know, from the evil spirits that lurk or from the, uh, from the natural phenomena that happen in the world. And then uh, the final line I'm giving on Heraclitus, which is the famous, it's, it's his most famous fragment, basically, fragment B53, uh, in which he speaks, um, he's mocking basically Homer, there, because Homer was the first one to say that Zeus was the father of God, gods and men. And Hesiod uh, also says that Zeus is the father of God, gods and men. And he says, war is the father of all. Not Zeus is the father of all. War is the father of all. So strife, struggle is the father of all. And the king of all. And he, he uses it, it as a personification. That's why I'm saying he, not it. Okay. He has sown some into gods. So God shows who, uh, so war shows who is going to become God. Through the struggle of the pantheon, different gods are emerging, basically. Um, some into humans, and some he made slaves, and some freemen. So basically, uh, if you lose a, a war, you cannot become a god, you cannot become a freeman, you are going to end up in a miserable place and think. Hercules or whatever, that we didn't end up as slaves in ancient times, it would have been terrible. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, so, uh, two, two more uh, things I'm going to show you. I'm going to show here. The first one is uh, this one that Derek is going to show you now. Uh, is basically 
Uh, this guy, whom I find greatly interesting, uh, he is called Theodoros, or Theodorus, whatever, Theodor is the equivalent English name, the atheist. And uh, can you imagine, like, any other religion but the ancient Greek one, having a guy who wrote on religion, he wrote a book on God, and he's called the atheist. And he was the first atheist, I mean, that he said, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in those things. And... Uh, uh, the funny thing is, his name is Theodorus, the, the gift of the gods or the gift of God. Because <laughs> it, it can go either way, the gift of God or the gift of the gods. And he was a funny guy. I mean, he, he gave many arguments to other philosophers. And he said that you can commit crimes, basically, that are uh, punished by religion as sins. But they are not sins because it, it, you have to, to take into account the aspect under which you, you commit those crimes. And uh, finally, I'm, uh, I'm concluding here uh, with Jesus as a manifestation of Greco-Roman gods. So in the Gospel of John, we have many I am statements in which Jesus would, um, uh, would tell us what uh, attributes we can ascribe to him as a deity. And he says, I am the bread of life, which is nourishment, of course, and this this one is similar to fertility cults like Demeter or Ceres, because uh, the daily bread in the prayer is basically nourishment. It's like, let us not die of starvation, because people died of starvation during these times. Then he says, I'm the light of the world, which is basically Apollo. Apollo was the god of light. Um, and um, he, was, uh, he was also Helios or Sol in the, in the, Roman, in the Roman pantheon. He, uh, Sol Invictus, in particular, the un, un, the unconquerable son, the undefeated one, the great one, whatever. And uh, and Baal, as well, uh, during the Roman period, has become this sort of sun deity. But Baal is, is quite older as well. Then he says, I'm the door. And this one uh, I find quite interesting because um, I think he refers to the... Um, to this idea that the Romans knew, not the Greeks uh, per se, but the Romans surely knew about uh, Janus. Janus was a Roman god. He was a two-faced god. So he had a good aspect and a, ba and a bad aspect. He was the god of love, let's say, at one hand. At, at the same time, he would be happy to, uh, to kill those who desecrated his place, like Jesus would do uh, to the to those who were in the temple and were desecrating the temple by selling and buying things and whatever. And uh, Janus in particular was the god of uh, gates, doors, and he was also um, this deity that uh, was placed in between heaven and earth. So he was god and human, sort of human at the same time. Then he also says, I'm the good shepherd, which is... Uh, as uh, Derek will show you an image of that, uh, uh, of, um, of Hermes holding uh, sheep and cattle. And, uh, and also uh, this, uh, this deity, Pimandris, from the Hermetic texts, which is uh, a bit older than Christianity and is a, a, a very interesting yet uh, mysterious cult of a religion. Um, in which, by the way, in which text uh, I'm going to add here, God is both male and female, because uh, God can be everything. Okay? And, uh, all right. And then uh, he also says, I'm the resurrection and the life, which is uh, uh, Zeus or Phanis, the, the primordial uh, resurrected being in the Orphic tradition, or Adonis, whom um, part of my name is uh, inspired by. I mean, you can... Uh, <laughs> You can, uh, I don't know, call my mother on that. <laughs> and then, because, uh, <laughs> I mean, she came up with it. And then uh, Dionysus, who was this um, dying and um, and rising god, Osiris, the, the Egyptian god, and Persephone as well, a female goddess, who was the spouse of uh, Hades. And being the wife of Hades, she would resurrect yearly uh, from spring 
to uh, fall and from fall until winter she would be down in Hades and thus the nature would be sad and nobody but uh, it, it's the same thing with with Easter cele celebrations because uh, you know in, in Christianity it's basically a, a circle of celebrating the same the same festivals the the Christmas festival the birth and then the death and the, resur the, the resurrection it was more or less the same, and it happened more or less during the same period of of, uh, of the se seasonal period. And then he says, "I'm the way and the truth and the life." Again, uh, uh, the truth um, deity was Alithia in the Greeks or Veritas in in the Romans. Uh, Hermes was a god associated with roads because uh, that's where many bandits would go, and you pray to Hermes for some bandits that respect him not to kill you or whatever. <laughs> it's quite <laughs> crazy. And then uh, you have uh, Zeus as well, who was a god of life and uh, a heavenly per personage or whatever. And then he also says, I'm the vine uh, and, and you are, uh, I don't know. And then, um, and then the, this one is Dionysus, basically, because the vine was holy to Dionysus. And, he describes uh, himself in a way that um, people of the ancient period could um, understand him through their own myths. And as I've said, like Apollonius of Tyana and Jesus, they were uh, trying to enter into the club of, uh, of the followers of the, of the ancient gods, Greeks and Romans, and then uh, they would take over and they would... Uh, pose their own agenda and go forward and whatever. Okay. I think that was it. Derek, uh, I don't know if it took a bit more, but I hope it was interesting. Oh, wow. Yes, absolutely interesting. I have never taken that close of an examination on the gods in the Greco-Roman world or Greek world. And then, of course, later on, we find this evolution into the Roman world. So I have to say I'm extremely thankful for the time and energy you put into explaining these things because I'll be honest with you. I purchased, I purchased some new books, right? Mm -hmm. um, over here I have Herodotus, right? If um, I start yeah, reading it right now, so if mm -hmm. I start to read it, I'm not going to have a clue on what a lot of the words and names sure. and things like that even mean because mm -hmm. nobody has explained to me the name of a god or the name of a mountain or a city and how it associates itself with that god or, or whatever. Um, I got some poetry as well. Mm -hmm. um, like what? Apollodorus. Oh, okay. all right. Okay. Sure. So, so, for example, I got Apollodorus yeah. here. Okay. Mm -hmm. The Library mm -hmm. of Greek yeah. Mythology. I got um, uh, Livy, the early history mm -hmm. of Rome, right here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, Metamorphosis. Okay. So, oh, Ovid. Yeah. Uh, Ovid, yes. Metamorphosis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Ah, actually, this this idea of transfiguration or metamorphosis or whatever is, I, I would say it's mostly Roman, but of course there were some uh, transfigurations in in the Greek uh, myths. But uh, Ovid was the one who who would go to transfigure everyone, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I also got uh, Calero and the Ephesian story. So um, ah, I, I, okay. I picked up some some Greco-Roman literature, but my uh, another one right here that I'm interested in dying is the Satyricon, which probably plays along the Gospels. Um, mm -hmm. There's some scholars who recently pointed out that it's it's being satire even to yeah. the Gospels. There's a part where it talks about the cr the cock crowing after my, the third. Huh? My father gave me actually a book recently, which was uh, the Onology, which means basically um, the logy means. Uh, uh, let's say the um, I don't know, like uh, cosmology is like the study of something. Okay, so yeah. it, uh, the the honest part in Greek is like the donkeyology, and basically it was about guys mocking Christians on their god being an ass, a donkey, basically. Okay, yeah. and and it, it also had the Alexamenos graffito and those things, <laughs> and yeah. it was like satire. There's actually in um, in Gnostic, so this book right here, mm -hmm. the Cre the Evil Creator yeah, sure. by M. David Litwa. He goes in, and as you can see in the front page, the front cover, 
um the head is like a donkey um in um it should you, be uh, seth actually which is seth yes yeah. mm -hmm. that's the point he was trying to say and there was a lot of antagonism to jews they mocked mm -hmm. them and said you're god you don't want us to see him you want to hide <laughs> him because he has the head of a donkey or something yeah uh, what kind of, of thing is he, are you are you hiding there yeah sure sure <laughs> the other one i have is just ancient greek philosophers i have um okay. So this but by is, whom is that one? This is by, uh, it's a Canterbury Classics. Okay. So as far as the authorship goes. Maybe it's um, a collection of works. It's a collection. Mm -hmm. I believe it mm -hmm. is. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this goes into, just I'll name them just so you know. The first, mm -hmm. As, Asli, uh, Aclibades, Plato. Asclepiades. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Ap Apology, Plato. Crito, Plato. Mm -hmm. Symposium, mm -hmm. Plato. Uh, Phaedrus. Plato, Phaedo or Phaedo, Plato, mm -hmm. Poetics, yeah. uh, Aristotle, Rhetoric, Aristotle, me um, Memorabilia, Xenophon, mm -hmm. Hellenica or Hellenica, uh, mm -hmm. Xenophon, in Intiridian, yeah. uh, Epictetus, Letter to the oh, um, Menoceus, mm -hmm. Epicurus, Principal mm -hmm. Doctrines. Epic My point is, in mm -hmm. all of this, is simply you've given me um, inspiration to want to read this stuff more i'll know when i hear a philosopher say something about a god it can kind of help me navigate the world a little better so that i can understand what's going on but also yeah, i'm glad about that you know <laughs> yeah i'm very thankful for this but it also makes me want to see about connecting dots mm -hmm. between the greek world and those ideas and the biblical world the 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 even the Hebrew Bible, there are ideas mm -hmm. about chaos, which in Genesis one, disordered. Mm -hmm. You know, when I read about Genesis one, no academic critical scholar that I talk to is thinking ex nihilo. No, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is disorder, and mm -hmm. God is coming over and He's organizing. So mm -hmm. this is why you find there's a uh, a chiastic structure in Genesis one where genesis day one correlates to genesis day four genesis day two correlates to genesis day five, five. and genesis mm -hmm. three with six mm -hmm. you know you got water and then you got mm -hmm. he separates the waters over here uh, mm -hmm. and and each one like he dries the land land animals are created in day five he you know it, each of them is correlating with each other there's organization on purpose so the mm -hmm. chaos is becoming orderly, and that seems to mimic and replicate that. It also gets interesting when you talked about. I'm just commenting on the some cool things you said. Yeah, is, sure. Um, Go ahead. I mean, when you talked about Kronos and then Kronos, Kronos mm -hmm. eating his children. Mm -hmm. Um, I was thinking of that story in Revelation 12. You mean the, Uranus and Kronos? So it's Uranus. Sorry, like I, Uranus, I, uh, the the planet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm looking at the woman in Revelation 12 who's giving birth in the wilderness ah, or running from the dragon. The mm -hmm. dragon's ready to devour the who, child. Who, who is described in very bad language. Right. I wonder spoiler, if, uh, spoiler alert for fundamentalists. Yes. I think that, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, is this dragon... Mm -hmm running off the myth of Kronos because he's wanting to eat his children, it seems. Or it, it might be something to this. Well, that sounds like an interesting one. I mean, I, I've read the, the book of Revelation back when I was younger or something, but I, I cannot tell you right now because I, yeah. I don't have it in front of me. But maybe in, in a later part, we can do that thing. Yeah, sure. I'm mm -hmm. just thinking about that too, the fact that Hades is mentioned a lot in Revelation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It liter literally names the place Hades. It makes you wonder, is it a place or is it the God himself mm -hmm. who, who is so, being cast down, you know? So uh, so on this notion that I, I, I spoke before, like in the beginning of, of my presentation, basically, I said... Um, but Jesus was a healer. How can uh, Christianity need of, uh, is in need of sickness and suffering people and stuff? So I think it's because of that. Because in the Greek uh, pantheon, you have a place for a disabled person like 
Hephaestus, and he can be a god. He's a perfect god. He has no flaws, except he cannot walk. Okay, he needs to to uh, ride on a donkey or something. Right. Uh, but uh, Jesus, unfortunately, and uh, the tradition of Christianity that emerged from him or Paul, more most likely, uh, is in need of suffering. So, if you have nobody to heal, then healing gods are not. Uh, necessary. If you have nobody to heal and you have doctors to heal you, basically, yeah, but he's programmed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. We must do this again. Thank you so much. If you found this glad. interview interesting, go help Demos out. Go help him out. Go give him a one time. The link is in the description on his PayPal. You want to help him out? He could use the help. We want to see him come back here to Myth Vision. So thank you so much, Demos. And I look forward to our other episodes that we plan on doing. Sure. Uh, if you allow me a final thing, it yeah. would be you. Ah, Myth Vision. <laughs> <laughs> That's for you and the audience. Thank you <laughs> I love so you much. Yes, thank you. Yeah, he's right. Never forget. We are. Ladies and gentlemen, join Myth Vision's Patreon not only to support us, but there are 72 videos that I did with Dr. Dennis R. McDonald and Richard Carrier, all on the Patreon, early access. You guys can ask personal questions when I go to interview these scholars and you're helping Myth Vision grow.